Welcome to the Eureka Centre, to Eureka Our Stories. We're really pleased to have four descendants of Eureka uh, figures of note with us today to mark the 168th anniversary of the Eureka Stockade. And today we gather on the land of the Wadarung people where the Eureka Stockade occurred and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Of course, um, today is also Eureka Sunday, which is the day in which we invite the community into the Eureka Centre in its diversity and try to find as many accessible uh, and inclusive entry points into the Eureka story as we can. And I think what better way to connect with Eureka, to have that tangible connection, than to be in the presence of four descendants. So today our panellists will discuss their own journey to personally connect with the Eureka story and they'll also reflect on their role in adva advancing the Eureka legacy. So it's going to be a really stimulating conversation. And before I introduce the panellists, I'd just like to ask you all to turn off your phones, please. Uh, and also there won't be any questions at the end of the session. It's going to be a dynamic session anyway. But if you'd like to mingle afterwards and speak with the panellists, that'll be happy to talk to you and answer any questions that you have. So it's now my pleasure to introduce the panel, beginning with Marianne Messer, who's the, panelist, uh, the, the panel's chair today. And until 12 months ago, Marianne, who's an educator and journalist, did not know that she was a descendant of miners' rights advocates, Timothy and Anastasia Hayes. And uh, Timothy was, of course, active in the Ballarat Reform League, and his wife is believed to have been one of the three women to have sewn the Eureka flag. And Marianne found out about her ancestors through a chance conversation with a distant cousin. And it turns out that some of the members of Marianne's family were ashamed of those, that rebel connection. But Marianne, however, is very proud of their courage and, and the legacy. That, they, that she's inherited. Uh, now, Val Dangri, OAM, uh, legend in Ballarat. I think a lot of people know Val's story. In 1973, Val was approached by the mayor of Ballarat to undertake conservation on the Eureka flag at the Ballarat Fine Art Gallery, now known as the Art Gallery of Ballarat. The works were completed over a two week period. Is that correct, Val? Sorry? Was it completed over a two week period? Yes, yes. yes. It was Right. I'm and sure there's a in my spare time. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of planning lead in the lead up to that. Um, and Val often worked late into the night. And Val's husband Norm accurately measured the flag and made detailed drawings, which I know many people have drawn on with for the for the standardised version of the flag. Um, in nineteen eighty, many years after she undertook the conservation work, Val discovered that she was the great great granddaughter of Anastasia Withers. Uh, who is one of the w women reputed to have um, sewn the flag. And I'm sure you don't consider that her, her to have been reputed to have sewn the flag. I think you're quite convinced that she, in I fact, did. I feel we have from what I've heard from other uh, relatives. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. But like so many things with Eureka, the flag and its story is also very contested. And, but a small mark, a W on the flag, could be that link and Val was recently awarded a Medal of the Order of Australia for her services to community history preservation. So that was this year, so congratulations, Val. It's an important recognition. <laughs> Peter Lawler Philp, uh, the descendant of probably the most famous Eureka, famous Eureka protagonist. Peter is a broadcaster, feature writer, and journalist, and he's the great great grandson of Eureka Stockade rebel leader, Peter Lawler. He has written extensively about the activities of the Lawler family from Tentacle Leash, Ireland, and, uh, and the issues surrounding the Eureka Stockade. Peter is currently leader of Lawler's Australia, which is a member of the Lawler's International Clan, and is completing the history of the Tentacle Lawler family, including its social activities up to the present day. I need to thank Peter because the Eureka Centre has just signed a cultural accord with Tentacle Lawler House, which is the birthplace of Peter Lawler and the politically active Lawler family. And Peter has been instrumental in forging that connection between Ballarat and Leash. So, so thank you very much, Peter, for your efforts in that, in establishing that relationship. And Owen King, uh, 
representing the, the I guess the government side of of the argument and you know a, a testament to the fact that Eureka descendants for both sides of the argument or the battle are very committed to the furtherance of the Eureka legacy and Owen is the great grandson of Trooper John King and uh, Trooper King gave ev evidence at the Eureka trials where he said I took down took the flag down this is the flag and when the flag was not claimed by anyone after the battle, Warrnambool police returned the flag to John King. And in 1895, the flag was loaned to the Ballarat Fine Art Gallery and his descendants donated it to the gallery in 2001. The King family's custodianship and subsequent donation of the Eureka flag means that arguably Australia's most treasured textile artefact has been preserved. So the King family's obviously made a very important contribution to the Eureka legacy. I'll now hand over to our chair, Marianne. Uh, so please well, uh, join me in welcoming our panel. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out. I was going to stand up there, but I'm going to stay here, I think. Um, as you've heard from the introduction, we all have a connection to an amazing story in Australia's history. And the great advantage we have as from having that connection is so much research has been done. So we can know so much about our family members and that's a huge advantage and a great honour. Um, for example, I'm sitting next to the descendant of Anastasia Withers. Our ancestors sewed the flag together, which is such a lovely thing. We're sitting together and we have a connection. We think, I wonder if our great, great grandmothers would have felt uh, excited to see us here today and I think they would have um, if they'd had a minute to think because mine had six kids and she's sewing a big flag um, but yeah we, we we really treasure this connection and as you heard from the introduction from Anthony uh, for me this is a recent discovery um, my family my side of the family were ashamed of being associated with rebellion and treason and the story was not told, and I did not know anything of it until a chance conversation with my second cousin, Leon, with whom I sat for the first time at a table last night at the Eureka dinner and just pumped him for information. And he is the custodian of our family's connection. Um, so without him, I wouldn't have known. And it's been a beautiful discovery. And as I said, I've got rich information about my ancestors which is a great blessing. So to begin today, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to tell a little story about what they know about why their ancestor was, how they got to be there at Eureka. And to kick off, I'll ask to tell you a little bit about my ancestors, and I feel a bit of a fraud because I'm so recent to the information, but what I do know about Anthony and Timothy, uh, Anthony, sorry, Anthony, Anastasia and Timothy, is that they were from Kilkenny in Ireland and that they already had uh, a lot of issues with um, poverty and disenfranchisement because they were educated, they were part of the new middle class in Ireland and were already disappointed in the fact that they didn't have a voice. Um, they were part of the Young Ireland movement and their disappointment also extended to poverty because of the famine. So they moved to England, they moved to Staffordshire and had two children there. And Staffordshire was a hotbed of Chartism, which was again a middle class movement saying, we want to have some say in our future. We don't want to be told all the time what will regulate our lives. For example, the poverty, the, the poor house was the solution to poverty at that time. They wanted a different solution. They wanted government support, they wanted a government voice. And this was con considered very dangerous in the UK, in England. Um, the, those who were in power, the, the monarchy and the landed people, were very fearful of the Chartists. And that's a whole other story. Uh, but eventually, um, Anastasia and Timothy must have decided it was too big a fight and they needed to go somewhere else. So they brought their family out here. They had five children by this stage and Anastasia gave birth on the goldfields to her sixth. They went into partnership with Peter Layla um, in, a, in a deep mine. That was a new thing for Ballarat, to have a deep mine. Um, the alluvial gold was running out, so people were committing to Ballarat. And it caused 
for Anastasia and Timothy and Peter an opportunity to really connect and commit to Ballarat and to share their ideas and their passion for Chartism, for a voice, for that, as it's been um, stated in the Ballarat Reform League Charter, that the power should reside with the people. So taxation without representation was an anathema to this family, as it was to many. And because of deep mining, people were together for long times during the day and at night. And um, that was where I imagine, I only can only imagine, the conversations began. Um, so uh, during Eureka, Timothy and Anastasia, as you've had described, were involved in many ways. Um, and then after Eureka, there was a huge impact on them as a couple and on their family. Um, Timothy was taken off for, uh, to be arrested, he was arrested for treason and he was put in, in the old Melbourne jail. And the family, now that I know from Leon, the story was told that he was so badly treated um, that he never recovered and he never actually went back to being the father of the family. Um, he was involved for a short time, but eventually went to the California gold fields um, where he wasn't successful. He came back and worked on the Melbourne railway and then um, died in an asylum. And in the meantime, Anastasia, who's to all accounts a, a feisty woman, um, and my husband said he can see there where the connection is, um, but um, I'm not sure. Um, and she held the family together, raised them, and, and did a, a marvellous job. And at the end of her life was described as a fine woman of Eureka in her obituary in the Ballarat Times and described also as um, a, a, a pillar of society and a feisty woman. Um, so that's my ancestors' stories, which I've only just, as, as we've said, discovered. So let me turn now to Val and ask her what she knows about her ancestor and how she got to be at the Eureka Goldfields. Thank you. Well, my story started well after the flag. I did the flag restoration and then it was just by chance that my daughter's ballet led us up to Ararat and this lady was standing at the door when we were coming out after the competitions and she pulled at my sleeve and said, can I speak to you? And I said, oh, in a minute, I'll just get my daughter settled. She's got to change her ballet costumes. I went back and she was waiting and that's how I found out about our connection. Now, when I look back, my grandmother, as a child, used to take me over with the lunches for her mother over the other side of Russell Square because she lived in Scott's Parade. And on our wanders back there and coming home again to her home, she used to chat to me and she said, you've got to be very pleased with your family name. And I said, oh, why, Gran? I'll tell you later. And I never got to hear about it until this lady spoke to me. Well, it was a busy day, so I took her address and rushed up there the next weekend because I couldn't believe it. I thought, goodness, history. And I loved history. So at any rate, um, I went up the next weekend and she very kindly spoke to me about it and said she was a small child when Anastasia Withers was alive and she said, oh, yes, we lived with Grandma. And that's when she said, oh, Grandma told me that it was very secret mm -hmm. because, of course, if you were found even years later having been involved with Eureka, the police would come in, mm -hmm. confiscate everything, and you'd be put in jail. So at any rate, uh, Auntie May's talk went on, and she told me that they came out, Anastasia Withers, she came out uh, from England and, of course, went to Tasmania. And there, while she was there, she met up with her husband-to-be, and this is how it started. 
They both came out separately from different directions and, of course, having abused the English law and the things they pinched. I mean, if I was over there and I was hungry, of course you'd pinch something to, to uh, so, sell off and eat. Mm. So that's the reason they got caught twice, she did, and they were sending her out with her girlfriend. So, excuse me, but Val, you have a double reason to be proud. You have a convict in your past and yes. you read the heroine. Yes, yes. true, it is, isn't it? Yeah. So at any rate, the family, they came across to Melbourne and, of course, Anastasia and Samuel decided that their children and any more that were going to be born, she had one to him over there in Tassie. She said, we're not going to encroach on ever mentioning the word again coming from England as we did. So the story that I've heard from my mother was they came out from England with a small child and they were married. Well, they weren't. They were married in Tassie, but at <laughs> any rate, they came out from London and they came round to Melbourne and started their life at Sandhurst. Now, of course, when I went checking a few things after hearing about this story. Amazing, the ship was mentioned as uh, the Launceston. And a little bell rang then and I thought, ah. Oh. any rate, I thought that really makes sure that they were over in Tasmania. And so they came out and went on to um, Sandhurst and it was up in Sandhurst they started a, uh, a hotel and there were other shopkeepers around in the area where they were and one of them had a teenage girl. She ran off to marry her boyfriend, I think, which is something mother didn't want to hear. So they came to Ballarat about the same time that our Anastasia and Samuel came. Now, According to what I've heard from the Duke family, yes, they remember Anastasia, and yes, she helped, uh, her, their daughter helped Anastasia with the sewing of the flag. So that would have been Annie Duke, yes. Yes, yes. that was wonderful to hear. Mm -hmm. So I did meet this ancestor. She was in Ballarat for another conference. And truly, I can see why some families just click together. I clicked with her and felt, well, if it was like that in their day, mm. you know, the old days, yes. the human nature doesn't change, but here we are again talking about the flag. It's fantastic. It was fantastic. And the amazing thing too is that you worked on that very flag and you told me before mm. that um, as you were working on it, not knowing you had a family connection with it, you called it your flag and you yes. had a real bond with that flag. <laughs> I did. And to find out there was a blood reason why you might yes. be bonded with it, especially like I that. think that's what shocked me. Yes. I didn't realise so it was something I said. And while I was working on the flag, of course, it was after hours a lot of the time mm. uh, at the gallery. And uh, Norm, my husband, did a tape of the old songs of that era. Yes. And I loved it. I'd be singing away while I was sewing in this quiet big building. Yes. <laughs> the only noise I could hear was the downpipes with the rain dripping down and you could hear it coming down past us because I was in the upstairs gallery at the front, the Oddy Gallery. How lovely. And uh, yes, I did enjoy doing it, but again, I had my daughter down at my mother's, first time we'd been parted. Yes. So you <laughs> and made big I was trying hard to get as many hours in mm. so that I could have a couple of days with my daughter, but it, didn't work out like that. Well, thank you for your sacrifice, as we were all benefiting mm. from So uh, that's thank how you. I learned about it. Mm. Lovely. Now, Peter, may I ask you, 
we all know a lot more about your ancestor than perhaps our ancestors. But um, can you tell us from your perspective his story? You've done so much research. How did he end up here? Well, I suppose from a very young age, we heard about Peter. Uh, Peter Lawler, we were very proud of um, his, 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 his achievements on the field. However, I think um, as I got older and researched more, um, the thing I learned was that Peter Lawler was not uh, a reluctant leader. He came from a, a pretty radical family. Uh, his father was Honest Pat Lawler, uh, who was the first Catholic member of the House of Commons for the County of Leash wasn't very popular, the Catholics and the Protestants used to fight in those days, and uh, he became um, uh, the first member, and he was a, a bit of a mover and shaker, particularly to get the tithe tax, the unfair uh, tax that was Im imposed on so many Irish families. But then uh, James Finton Lawler uh, was jailed a number of times by the British. Uh, he was a, a, a quite a fierce rebel in the sense that he was a writer, it was only once when things got quite desperate that he felt that uh, the, the writing wasn't enough, so he took up um, action against, against the British down uh, in Southern Ireland. Uh, didn't really work out, and finally he was jailed, and um, he, was, he would have been transported to Australia with a couple of his friends, uh, but he, for some reason, uh, he admitted that the people that were going to be ex uh, deported from England, in fact, were not the problem. He was the problem because he wrote the, the articles. But for some reason, he wasn't deported. Then a few years later, he died. But then uh, William Lawler, uh, another brother of Peter, he was, he, was a, uh, he was on the campaign trail in Ireland with, with his father. And uh, he also ran the property when his father went to London uh, to sit in Parliament. Uh, but one of my favourite Lawlers is what I call the Quiet Achiever, Richard Lawler. Uh, he was very close. He kept them all together uh, because um, some... He, uh, it's well known that uh, the father and James Finton had a, a number of disagreements. But ultimately, when you read the history from Ireland, uh, you'll find that the father had great respect for James Finton. But anyway, Richard was the Quiet Achiever and he came to Australia with... Peter, uh, and also uh, we believe Peter's wife, uh, Alicia Dunn, and Richard's wife was Alicia Dunn's uh, sister. So there was a lot of intermarriage there. Uh, and uh, the, both Richard Lawler and Peter Lawler were civil engineers. And uh, Peter w was very keen to work on the Geelong Railway to, to put his skills, and I think probably um, Richard was the same. But at that stage, um, uh, Honest Pat, the father, lost his seat in Parliament and there was a lot of pressure from Leash for Richard to come back and to take to, to stand for that seat, which he did, and he had a much longer time in Parliament uh, than his father did. But he achieved a lot of things, but he was the quiet member of the family, so I've got a great lot of respect. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is that um, it's not surprising that uh, this wonderful history uh, came from the Craig brothers who travelled out to Australia with the Lawlers and uh, quite, quite commonly in conversation, Peter was saying that his ambition was that he wasn't going to put up with the same uh, un, uh, injustice that he put off in, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And he said, before, before I'm much older, I will attempt to get into government and to make sure that this injustice doesn't reign. Mm -hmm. So the, the old theory, and he, even in my family, was he was very reluctant. He wasn't reluctant. He was a rebel. He was born into a, a very uh, progressive family, uh, not, not always respected by the authorities. So uh, it wasn't surprising uh, that he... I mean, I think he was reluctant in the sense that he wasn't a military man. And when, when we're at the great uh, meetings here, he was saying, well, I'm maybe not the right person because, I, you know, there, there are other people that probably had military experience that I haven't had. So I think he was reluctant from that point of view. Mm -hmm. But certainly for change... Uh, he was a rebel. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. The other thing I would say that uh, one of the things we were brought up with was um, I was brought up by my grandmother, uh, Eileen Mary Lawler, and she was the clan leader. She, and the women actually, well after Peter, Peter's, uh, my grandfather, uh, Dr. Peter Anthony Lawler, we've got to say, 
use the second names because everyone's a Peter in our family, so it gets very confusing. <laughs> so Peter Anthony, my grandfather, he was a psychiatrist, and uh, he brought a lot of reform into these dreadful asylums that we had in the past days. And uh, when his, he was over in uh, New Norfolk, in uh, Tasmania during the war as the medical superintendent, and when the staff felt they were being robbed by the state government as far as wages, he as their manager went to the trades hall and stood up for them and said, these people deserve a rise. The people on the mainland have got it, we want it here. So there was a bit of rebel in, uh, in Peter Anthony, Dr Peter Lawler. But I think um, one of the things we were drummed into us as young people from, from my grandmother, dear old grandmother, was be proud of what the Lawlers have done. Not only Peter, but James Finton and all the others. However, don't live in their shadow. Get out there and do something yourself. So we're always encouraged not to just to say, oh, I'm proud of my grandfather. What have I done? Yeah. And if I've done nothing, then shut up. <laughs> and uh, I'll just pay one little tribute to, and I'll mention a bit later on, my cousin Christine Mary Gillespie Lawler, she was a wonderful person and uh, did a few things uh, in the very early age uh, and, uh, um, with uh, Eureka's children, now Eureka Australia, uh, and very, very proud. So she was a bit of a rebel in herself. So I think the advice from my grandmother, get out there and do something to make sure that the good rights that have been won are maintained. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, Thanks. we're going to continue that discussion because that's a really important point. But can I now ask Owen, tell us how your ancestor happened to be here during the Eureka skirmish. Um, John King was another Irishman. So uh, uh, he came, but he was Northern Irish. Uh, he joined the British Army uh, and went, was in I India. Uh, until 1852 when he uh, got his discharge along with his brother Hugh. Uh, they came out here to Victoria, um, tried a bit of gold mining and that sort of thing and obviously not successful because he joined the Victorian Police Force in uh, 1854. Well, both of them went in, were in the police force and they came up with uh, the troopers that came up when the, all the uh, Eureka activity was starting. And he was ultimately the trooper that pulled the flag down off the flagpole at the, in the stockade. Mm. So the flag went back to the police camp, which was up in Camp Street, where the gallery is. Uh, and... Uh, when the trials were on in Melbourne, uh, various people were asked about the flag because there's so many different drawings in books of that time. And uh, he said this was the flag that he pulled down off the flagpole. So the flag was left with the police at that stage. And then at some time later, after he'd gone down to Warrnambool, where he operated uh, or was a partner in a, an aerated water factory. I don't know what else was in there, but uh, <laughs> it was uh, soft drinks, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, he had, the flag was given back to him by uh, the, uh, the police and the family had it with them right from that time until 1895. Mm. They had it with them in uh, Warrnambool, uh, he and his brother-in-law moved to Lake Bolac with a flour mill and then ultimately moved up to Minyip when the land was opened up for selection and incidentally the family still has that wow. uh, original selection. Uh, the three, three of the brothers actually selected land there uh, at Minyip. Mm. Uh, so the flag was with the family until 1895 when uh, Isabella, uh, John's wife, uh, loaned it to the gallery. And uh, one of the interesting letters that she wrote to uh, the gallery said that she was sorry about the delay in sending it down, but she 
had promised it to uh, be a uh, an icon on display at the, the Wesleyan Bazaar in Minyam. So she sent it down to here to Ballarat, mm -hmm. wrapped up in brown paper and uh, sent it down by rail. Wow. So that's how things moved around there and subsequently my grandmother uh, at various times checked on the flag here in Ballarat. One story was that she was concerned that they weren't looking after it very well. It was a bit dirty and tatty. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Len Fox started on the looking into things in uh, 1945. And ultimately, you know, he re wrote several books regarding it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we were involved with uh, Margaret Rich uh, here at the gallery and the various discussions and it was decided that uh, the family would uh, donate the, the flag to the gallery as was mentioned earlier and uh, uh, that, that's where it's where it went to. Mm. So all of the family were well aware of uh, that part of their, their history. Yes. Of, uh, that the flag had been with, on the farm. Mm with the family for for 40 years before mm. it came down here to Ballarat. So your family was well aware of its significance as an artefact, um, as, a, yes. as a memory of that yes. important yes. time in history. How did that impact on you as a young boy growing up and what was your impression? Well, I guess it was just uh, one thing that I could say was my grand, great grandfather was the the man that pulled it down off the flag. Yes, pole, yes. Was, and it was, was openly the, spoken about in your family? Not, not to a great deal, but okay. we were all, all aware of it. Sure. That, yes. that, was, that was there and the flag mm. was down here in Ballarat. Mm. And uh, yeah. when uh, uh, we were finding various things, joined myself around the house in, in uh, letters and, and all that, we had all the copies of uh, letters that came to my grandmother uh, and to my great grandmother from the, the gallery. Yes. Now, now we have copies from both sides. The, the gallery provided mm -hmm. us with copies of the letters that went the other way. Oh, that's great. So uh, we've got quite a significant file. Yes. Uh, in Joy and I have of uh, the, these uh, activities and. Uh, where it goes to from there, I'm not sure. Uh, the family's got that much mm. more scattered. So. It's important, yeah. important information, an important aspect of the of yeah, the Eureka the, story. The, the record is is there. Yes. Of, uh, what what went on in the, in mm. the family and uh, how the particularly the fact that I suppose that John King was able to recognise the flag at the at the trials when. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Carboni and a number of those other writers had all sorts of funny shapes for the yes. for the flag. So he was able to authenticate it and yes, identify it and as a genuine article. Yeah, yeah which is because really he did important. try to sell it to the uh, uh, Victorian uh, 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 Library, mm -hmm. Melbourne Library, but again, nobody could guarantee that it was. Uh, mm -hmm. He said it was the right flag, but nobody else could. Yeah. Authenticate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even even as mentioned in the trials that Peter Peter Lawler couldn't even say that yes. that was the flag. Well, had mind his mind was on other things. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it was only on the flagpole for a very short time. That's right. Yes. So, uh, That's had a huge impact for having been flown for such a short time in his in history. And mm. again, an, a, another interesting aspect about Eureka is that while it was um, designated as a defeat, it's it gone on to become something that represents a victory. Yeah. And I think that's always so Australian, isn't it, that we're so good at making a, think, a victory out of a defeat. You look at Gallipoli, um, yeah, various aspects during our history where we've taken something that forged us as a nation that was actually a defeat. Yeah. There, are, there are comments from within the family that... Uh, uh, John King had said that if he wasn't in the police force, he would have been with the miners. Wow. Yeah. So 
Yeah, so he was there. To he see. had a job to do. And yeah, and he'd be delighted to see the outcome then. And the mm. four of us sitting together. <laughs> yeah, it's a really cool thing. Um, Peter, you talked about the impact of having Peter Lalo as your ancestor, especially through the voice of your grandmother, as using it as an inspiration, but not to define you, saying, take what has been done in the past, but then don't live in its shadow, move on. Do you see that as having happened in your life? Oh, well, I don't want to talk about myself, uh, but um, I, I do. I think um, it was my grandmother uh, and my good wife, who's here today, that encouraged me to take um, a, a fairly strong stand during the 1980s in Latin America. I spent a lot of time in Latin America during a time when we had some of the worst, um, uh, the worst military dictatorship. We were surrounded by death squads, and I don't want to get into politics here, but also we were fighting the United States one of the most dangerous places in El Salvador at that time was the United States Embassy. Um, and um, I think it was just a natural thing. You know, uh, another very important thing that really needs to be raised is that uh, with a lot of our Irish families, religion, our Christianity was very important. And um, the, the Catholic social justice teaching, while it may not have always been practiced by some of the bishops, um, it was very strong in our family. Yeah. So um, uh, it was a bit of a natural thing. Yes. And, um, you know, I take no credit because I had some wonderful support in Latin America. But um, I'm very proud, I suppose, if I'd had the... Uh, if Philip Moore had loaned me a, a flag, I probably would have raised it over, over in El Salvador. <laughs> but um, uh, because even one of the Lawlers uh, fought uh, with O'Hara in Chile for freedom. Mm -hmm. And talking about Gallipoli, uh, um, the story goes we can't... Uh, authenticated is that um, Captain Joseph Peter Lawler, who was Peter Lawler's grandson, actually carried the Eureka sword over there. Now, there's a bit of debate over that mm. because um, in our dear old home, which was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty ragged old place in East St Kilda, we had the great big photo, uh, uh, um, the uh, portrait of Peter Lawler in a great big um, uh, um, uh, plaster for frame, and underneath it was the sword that Peter Lawler carried at Eureka, so wow. we're not quite sure. But certainly I think the, yes. the spirit is gone, and uh, we haven't reluctantly taken. I think mm. good old grandmother really has drummed it in, yes. that, uh, you know, you, you've got to do something. Mm. Don't, let, this, don't, don't yeah. let the oceans wash away yes. all the things we've achieved. Yes. And I think that's very, very pertinent today. <laughs> I agree. Mm. Um, the advantage that you two had was growing up knowing that was your legacy and the inspiration behind that. For Val and myself, we only came to that knowledge late, of lately, so <laughs> seven years ago for you, Val? Uh, well, it was seven years after I'd stitched the oh, flag, okay. yes. and since then we've had a reunion and I have met a lot of the men from Anastasia, her descendants. Yes. And the men really didn't know much about it. It was passed down through the women. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So there's a sadness there, and, and I guess the point I'm trying to make is that we have um, a responsibility to be sharing this story. So Peter, you said it's, you don't want to talk much about yourself, but your family story is not just your family story, it's our nation's story, mm, it is. and it's also a global story because mm. democracy in its form that we have here in Australia is uh, uniquely Australian, uniquely Victorian. So the secret ballot, for example. Last night we had Steve Brax talk to us at the Eureka Dinner, which is a night that the Eureka Australia group throw, and every year they choose a democracy hero to honour. And last night it was Steve Brax. And he talked about the fact that we often don't realise how significant Eureka was from a global perspective and equally from a multiracial perspective. Mm -hmm. So it was a time when races got together on the gold fields to... We're, we're representing Irish, but there were many, many races there, as you would know. Um, so a very significant time. So it's not just your story, Peter, and how it's impacted on you or Val or Owen mm. or myself. It's our story as, as a nation. And I want to get into the um, aspect of how do we see that responsibility. For us, the impacts have been personal, but for our nation, 
what happened at Eureka, and then probably later at Gallipoli, um, really defined us as a nation. So how can we carry that message on and instill in our young people um, the legacy that we have, the democracy that we have, and how precious and, and vulnerable it is? So do you have any thoughts on that panel? Does anyone want to make a, a reflection? I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to jump right in the middle of all of this. But I want to put a rider on it first. Um, I want to uh, just pay compliments to Eureka Australia, and we've got a, a great campaigner sitting in front of me now, Philip Moore. Um, they have done a wonderful job to keep the Eureka story going, not only the historic story, but the ongoing story. And Anthony uh, here with this wonderful centre. You know, uh, dare I say that this is more important than Sovereign Hill, uh, I believe, because it, it, t it tells the story. So what I'm about to say doesn't reflect these two wonderful organisations that I have great admiration for. But look, I think we've got to ask ourselves, if we're, we're here today, we could be out having coffee somewhere else, but obviously I would suggest that maybe we are the believers in the Eureka story. I think we've got to ask ourselves, I ask myself all the time, I ask my family all the time, even my little grandson, uh, uh, James Noah Lawler, who cut the flag, when we, uh, cut the ribbon when we opened the building, he, he's very proud of the family. But the question we've got to ask is, and he often says to me, Dad, uh, Grandpa, it's not very relevant. It's not really important in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's true, mm -hmm. it's not. I read, the, uh, I read the local paper here yesterday and I was amazed for their weekend magazine. There wasn't a, simple, a, si a single mention of this event. Now, maybe they did something early as a, as a news story, yeah. but in their weekend paper, why wasn't it there? Mm -hmm. I listened to Radio National, I listened to uh, 774, and in my listening time, I heard nothing about it. So it's not important in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's our mm -hmm. fault. You know, we, we've got to start talking about the positives. You know, it's all very well to talk about 1854. That was a wonderful year. That was the year the age was born. That was the year that the Victorian Railways ran their first train to Port Melbourne. It was a very important year, but Eureka was, was probably the, the, the finest point. But that's history. What's important with history? Let me go into another dangerous area. Where would, would we know anything about Jesus Christ if we only, only talked about Calvary. It's the fact that the story goes on and people will tell you that Jesus Christ is important in their life today, that maybe the story is still alive. And I think that should be the same with Eureka. Now, I'm going to jump into the deep end. And I'm sorry to take this up, but I really feel very strongly about this. Um, uh, we as a family used to come up. But my mother and my uncle Peter Lawler, another Finton, Peter Finton Lawler, used to come up and stand beside the cannons. Um, uh, so we knew all about it. But I think the most moving experience that the, the, Law, the Lawlers had was when the whole Lawler clan came up here uh, in, oh, sorry, oh, look, I'm getting too old here. Um, 2004. I think it, 2004, and we're all together, and we had come into this, not, not this current building, but uh, the, the former building, and we're all gathered under a tree uh, over near where this new wonderful um, uh, pathway of remembrance is. And we're sitting under there, and Christine Lawler Gillespie said, hey, what are we doing? What are we doing? You know, and we all said, well, we're having a good time. She said, in this town at the moment, tomorrow at one of the marches, David Hicks's father, Terry Hicks, will be there. We need to stand by him because why he's locked up in a concentration camp in Guantanamo Bay, no trial, at least the people at Eureka got a trial, uh, no trial, and he's now being tortured. And this has been verified by the US Marine lawyer who's a US Marine. So we actually marched with him, and when we went there, Christine, Sue Lawler, and myself actually gave him an embrace to say, you know, we don't, you know, 
if he is a terrorist, we don't agree with that. But we do believe in, in a democracy that this guy should have a trial and the Australian government shouldn't ignore him. The Australian, the only time the Australians ever went there, they went to Guantanamo Bay and, and Hicks thought, wow, I'm going to get heard. And the fellow said, let me state before we do anything else, I don't want to hear anything about you, I am only here to verify that you are Hicks. And he finished. Where is the democracy? Where is the justice? So we marched with him and we actually embraced him and it just happened that all the cameras and we were in the, I think we got page three in the age, we are in the sun. Uh, and then the other thing, a couple of national magazines that had nothing to do with Eureka said, can we run your story? Mm -hmm. Now, that was very significant because it put Eureka yeah. in, in 2004 back where it should be, in centre stage. Yeah. And I think we need to look at, and I've talked to the, the wonderful president of Eureka Australia uh, about this. We need to start moving and saying, what are the contemporary Eurekas? Mm -hmm. You know, in this very room, sitting in that chair yesterday, I heard one of the most wonderful statements uh, from an Indigenous leader who did a, a little opening ceremony for us. And he said, did you people know, and I didn't know, he said, did you people know that when, when the rubber hit the road and the military were out searching for people, any, anything to do with Eureka, the indigenous people took the children and some of the women and hid them. Yes, mm. I knew that. What a wonderful story. Mm. Yes. Eureka 2022, what are we doing for the voice? Mm. What are we doing for the voice? Are we going to let governments, as they did at Eureka, just override us? Eureka will live on if we carry the Southern Cross and the spirit into 2022. And, you know, we've had lots of discussions with a number of people at Eureka Australia to say that our, our democracy today is very fragile. Look at the world we live in. We, we, we're even talking about war again. Thought that had all gone. So Eureka Australia, Eureka in, in this wonderful building, this is the most important part of, of Ballarat, Alola will say. Um, uh, we've got to carry it through and we've got to talk. You know, there's opportunities on Talkback Radio to jump on and say, hey, but this is only what the, what the Eureka people did. We're going to do this in, in 2000 and, and, uh, 22, 23, 24. Yes. And we've got to get that into our young people, like my grandmother got into me. Yes. Yep, exactly. Okay, I'm sorry, am I making a, a speech here? You may <laughs> not agree. <laughs> a lot, lot of people said to me, <laughs> A lot of people said, Peter, this is all very well, this thing you did, uh, or you and Christine did, but how would Peter Law of you, you, uh, em embracing the father of a terrorist? And I said, I think if Peter Lawler was here today, he would march with you because the government thought he was a terrorist. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Sorry to so, go on. Not at all. I'm really happy, and I think we all are, to hear the, 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 the flag fly, flown again, to hear it flown. Um, that the challenge remains for us, those of us, I'm a recent discoverer, although I've always been a passionate supporter of democracy, but to, to recently discover just how important this story is has galvanised me. And I want to know, along with a lot of other people, what can I do to share this? And I know my ancestor, Anastasia, was an educator, and I think a lot of what we need to do is to tell the story in a way that's accessible so your grandson can see its relevance, mm -hmm. to share it in a way that excites our young people who have a passionate commitment to social justice. Mm -hmm. Our young people, there's nothing wrong with our young people. They are passionate about rights and human rights, look, looking after our planet, looking after our neighbour. So how do we galvanise them? Um, Eureka Australia are talking about reinstating the Diggers March, so that reignites that commitment from local people. You were getting hundreds and hundreds of people walking before COVID mm. on those Diggers Marches. Mm. That's a great way. The uh, Eureka Australia have developed some apps where people can retrace the significant places around Melbourne and in the very close future Ballarat, so that they can rehear the stories of what happened here. And that's terrific, but we have to be so careful not to be talking in an echo chamber where we're just talking to ourselves. We need to be sharing this story as broadly and as passionately and as relevantly as possible. 
So, Val, did you have any thoughts you about what to do? Oh, well, that's a very... It's a big question, Big isn't it? question, yes. I was going to say I've been more interested in hearing from people who have commitments to the Eureka and in one part um, I met up with the descendant of Evelyn Shaw. She was in Melbourne and they were going to do a march and wanted a Eureka flag. So she spoke to her mother who went to the gallery and got a drawing from it, drew it up roughly, and she also received a little piece from the flag. Well, then she sent it to her daughter. She passed it on to the CPA and uh, Rem McClintock was the one who was thrilled to get it and they made a flag. But the letter and the piece that was with it of the flag never got back to Evelyn. Oh, the souvenir. Then. And then, of course, mm. years later, when I was now already feeling I knew the flag inch by inch because I'd been all over it and could tell you where there are different thicknesses of threads, etc., mm. uh, I met up with um, Evelyn with her... Uh, she was at a dinner, Eureka dinner, and I was thrilled to meet her and hear her story. But, we, you know, I get lots of these little stories and it's so enlightening to think that even when I was stitching the flag, mm. the principal of the school that I was teaching at called an assembly and told the whole school that I'd been spending my holiday working on the flag so I found even just recently getting letters because of my OAM mm. it's the past students they remembered yes. so all these little things that you do towards Eureka mm. does bounce off on the young folk yes. it really does that's a great observation it really does yeah. that's wonderful another thing that she did say to um well, when it went in the flag, I had to make another replica in um, 2004 for the 150th year of Eureka, and the exhibition was going to Canberra and supposedly other towns. And I found that the flag went up there, and when I, w I was flown up to give a talk on it, and when I saw the flag in the actual old building of uh, Canberra, the Parliament oh, House, yes. yes, I was overwhelmed. I thought, oh, it fits the place. It yes. really looked good. Yes. But at any rate... Uh, it's a beautiful observation. And, and I had family members that flew up so that they could hear yes. the story and see the flag. Yes. Well, that flag now is back in the gallery mm. and I know that um, it's kept there and I suppose we hope nothing happens to the original flag, but we do have another flag. Yes, we do. And that leads me to the last point I'd like to make just as we finish up. Um, do you feel as a panel that the, the Eureka flag has been appropriated appropriately uh, by various groups and if not what can we do to reclaim it um, to as a representation of what we believe it represents so Owen do you have any ideas well, for your to see it, to see it uh, on uh, a lot of cranes on all the buildings no, doesn't impress me that it's on there mm. uh, just a couple of other points You've made comment about Eureka Australia. I have not heard of Eureka Australia. Okay, beautiful. I've got a uh, brochure right here. I'll and give it to you later. Uh, <laughs> the King family gave the flag to the gallery, and it is in here. It's on loan here, mm. 
and this place is calling itself the home of the flag, mm. the gallery in our view is the home of the flag. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I would prefer I to see, and anyone wants to see the flag, they've got to pay to come in. Mm. If it's up at the gallery, mm. it's free. Yes, okay. That's so um, those yeah, are the points that I would that. comments I would make. Oh, my, I'm surprised that um, even for the use of the Australian flag, yeah. that you know, it, it there should be regulations to say that it is the Australian flag or the Eureka flag, mm -hmm. and it can only be used by organisations that have a link yes. to it. It's yeah. you know, yeah. like trashing the Australian flag. Yeah. I don't go along with that either. Yeah, of course. Um, so maybe people say we've got too many regulations, but I think the regulations of the use mm. of the flag. Yeah, so it's would, a registered flag. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it's a beautiful flag. Oh, it is. It, it's mm. a beautiful thing. Now, Caboni that, was saying, what was it, Philip? The most beautiful flag in the whole of Europe. Yes, yes, yes. He, he made that comment about the Eureka flag. Mm. He said, there's no, sorry, there's no flag in, in, in old Europe that is as good as the Eureka flag. Beautiful. So yeah. we... we we're going to have to finish here, but we don't have to finish chatting. So I'd like to thank our panellists very much for coming along today. And on behalf of myself, thank you for the opportunity. It's been really joyful. It really has. So thank you. Thank you.